It's Cardano 360 time. Ready? Let's go. The nonchalance of this Cardano 360 had all the markings of an extremely confident team. It was almost like we were watching an interview of a sports team right before they're gonna clinch the championship. It's like, things could still go wrong, but they know all they have to do is execute like normal for a couple more months and they'll be the champions. That's because they know they actually took the time to do everything correctly. It's been very hilarious over the last couple of days to watch the Ethereum maximalists go through the whole ADA Cardano denial curve we talked about uh, several episodes ago over this whole $75 million loss thing where StakeHound or their custodial service provider, whoever you want to believe at this point, lost $75 million worth of Ethereum user funds. You know what I mean? This is, uh, if, if I'm remembering right, this is bigger than the DAO hack. And Ethereum staking hasn't been going on that long. We don't have a very long history of Ethereum staking, and we've already lost more Ethereum through Ethereum proof of stake than we did through the DAO hack. That's saying something. So as, as people, as the Ethereum maximalists react to this, it was super hilarious because their first reaction was definitely the whole denial thing. Uh, I, got, I got comments like, hey, you said this thing happened in your video, but I just Googled Ethereum and it's nowhere on the front page of Google. And of course, like by that time, I was already react. I was already responding back to them with, you know, like, hey, look, here's a link. Forbes is already covering this, bro. So, I mean, then they had to move on to a different argument, right? Once they accepted that this actually happened, they had to move to a different argument, like the deflection. So they'd come back with, yeah, but hey, this isn't like Ethereum's fault. And of course, you have to think about what's actually going on in that ecosystem. Ethereum had to make a bunch of design choices when they laid out the architecture for their proof of stake. And one of the choices they made was that they would, they would uh, create the right behaviors in people through slashing. Slashing is the forfeiture of your Ethereum if you do something that the system doesn't want you to do, right? Malicious behavior, you know, not validating blocks, going offline. There's a, there's a list of things you could do that can cause forfeiture of your Ethereum. And uh, in order for that to happen, right, um, a part of the whole system is uh, custodial staking. So you actually give up possession of your Ethereum in the case of custodial staking. So the stake pool has your Ethereum. You don't have it. And that was a necessary ingredient in the recipe that led to this loss of $75 million, right? This could not have happened in Cardano. In Cardano, when you stake, it's completely still in your possession. Your, 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 your ADA is still completely in your possession. You hold the private keys to your ADA. No one else can take your ADA. There's no way for you to forfeit your ADA. It, you can stake on a ledger. There's no way for that ADA to leave your ledger unless you push that button. They didn't design Cardano staking that way on accident. It's not like an accident that you don't have to send your ADA to staking pools. They wanted a completely decentralized staking system. They didn't want these centralized points of failure. Like, hey, everybody send your, send your Ethereum to the staking pool so that the staking pool can lose your keys. This was predictable, right? Whenever you have a centralization of a bunch of funds, there's always a danger that it gets hacked. There's a rug pull. They abscond with your crypto. They lose the keys. These things have happened over and over and over and over again in crypto. Vitalik says there's not a sufficient enough ROI on research for Ethereum to engage in research. But I would say over the very short history of Ethereum staking, they've already proved that there was an ROI in Cardano's doing the research to figure out a better way to do staking. And in this case, we can quantify that ROI. It's 75 million bucks already. There was some interesting partner discussion in this Cardano 360. 
starting with Nervos. Nervos and Cardano are involved in this partnership where there's going to be a bridge between Nervos and Cardano, where you'll be able to use your ADA on Nervos, including in apps running on that network, and Nervos users will be able to come over to Cardano and use their coins or tokens over on the Cardano network. I don't even know enough about Nervos to know know what kinds of uh, assets are circulating on their on their network. But I thought it was interesting. So they did they did cite uh, using ADA as collateral for loans on uh, a certain lending app that's being built on Nervos, which is all interesting. But it and it's it's super obvious that interoperability is a really big theme for Nervos. If you go on their website, it's a lot of talk about interoperability and you know all the networks being connected at some point. But the question I've always had about some of these partnerships is, you know, sort of the rationale behind the partnership. Why why is Cardano partnering with Nervos? And some of the possible answers that jumped into my head prior to today were, okay, maybe Nervos is just a test example of interoperability. They're just sort of the first ones to come along and Cardano is an open network. And they're like, yeah, anybody can build a bridge to Cardano and we'll even help you. And yeah, we're happy to be as interoperable as anybody wants us to be and anybody can bridge to us. We're happy to do it. I thought that was one possibility. I thought maybe there was something about Nervos also that made Nervos uh, a candidate for some special use down the road. Like maybe Cardano has some grand scheme and because Nervos is proof of work and UTXO, it makes it especially amenable to being, uh, you know, some kind of a side chain for something for Cardano down the road, you know, or, you know, Charles has talked about uh, how we might end up with many, many different types of, you know, proof of X, there could be proof of stake, the Plutarchy, and then proof of work, and then proof of memory, and proof of, you know, all kinds of proof of merit that might allow block validation, maybe Nervos is going to be a side chain that helps with some some form of that proof of x you know that was one possibility there's another possibility with nervos nervos is obviously a project with close ties to china that's not a secret in any way uh here's the team over at nervos but maybe maybe even more interesting is the list of investors of nervos Sequoia Capital, the very first investor listed. Sequoia is not just a VC firm. Sequoia Capital is the VC firm. They're gigantic. Go through the list of projects they've funded. It's every tech company you've ever used, right? The most gigantic, the most well-known, they funded everybody. They're the VC firm. So you got Sequoia Capital in there. This is new. This is something that's a little bit new to the Cardano ecosystem. Like Cardano is kind of infamous for not courting Silicon Valley. And here they are partnered with uh, this Chinese project that is obviously very cozy with Silicon Valley. <laughs> They're also cozy with Hobi. And Hobi, uh, you probably know, I believe up until 2018, they were doing uh, something like a billion dollars in trades per day. They're, they were an exchange, right? Doing a billion dollars worth of trades per day. Here you can see in March, 2018, Hobi processed around US 1 billion in trades daily, tremendously large volume. Then we see following a 2017 ban on Bitcoin exchanges by the Chinese government, Hobi stopped Bitcoin withdrawals. Hobi China continues to operate as a blockchain consulting and research platform. What does that mean, right? What does that mean exactly? In August 2018, in a reverse takeover, Hobi acquired a 74% stake in Hong Kong electronics manufacturer Pantronics Holdings, becoming listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So this is like, this is a reverse merger, right? You basically find a company that's already listed on your stock exchange of choice, and then you effectually you acquire that company but legally it's it's usually more like legally they acquire you even though you're the one paying value and the value you're paying for is the fact that they're listed on the stock exchange you know this can there's nothing nothing illegal about this you know in north american law it happens all the time and it can you know i mean it, it 
this can even happen with like actual operating companies, but often it's with uh, shell companies that have no actual operations. The only asset the company actually has is the fact that they're publicly listed and that's the value the acquiring in air quotes, the, the acquiring company is paying for. So I have no, I, I'm not saying that's the case here, but it is characterized here as a reverse takeover. You know, so they got on the Hong Kong st stock exchange. So this is an enormous, enormous company doing a billion dollars worth of exchange a day in 2017, that all gets shut off by the Chinese government and they become a blockchain consulting and research platform. And they are one of the big investors along with Sequoia Capital in Nervos. So there's a third possibility as to why Cardano was partnered with Nervos and why Nervos was featured on the Cardano 360. Maybe it's their connections, right? They are not a random blockchain project. They're not a random small cap blockchain project. They are very, very well connected. And maybe it's these connections that are, you know, a piece of the value of this partnership to Cardano. We don't know. It could be any one of those three things or maybe something else. Just, just thinking out loud here about possibilities. We also heard about Orion Protocol, their partner with Cardano, of course. Uh, Orion Protocol is building a terminal. It's a terminal that will be a gateway to both centralized and decentralized exchanges in a non-custodial way. So apparently the idea is you wouldn't have to KYC or have accounts on any of the platforms they're providing you a gateway to. You could just jump on your Orion terminal and you could trade across these different exchanges, regardless of whether they're centralized or decentralized. And it seems like they're also extremely agnostic. Uh, if you go to their website, they're partnered with everybody. To me, this is a testament to how open source Cardano truly is. Um, Orion Protocol is partnered with Ethereum, Binance, Avalanche, Elrond, Huobi again, Polkadot, Cardano, Phantom. They're, they're, they're very blockchain agnostic. They're, they're down with everybody. And I think it shows the complete lack of ego in Cardano. They want to be interoperable. They want to be open to everybody. Next, we heard from Revuto, which is a subscription management service. Uh, they have one of these business models that I think could hold a lot of utility for people's online lives. And maybe the most interesting thing is that they were able to recently complete a $10 million raise on the Cardano network. So definitely a sign of good things to come for Cardano. Capping things off, we heard from one of my favorites in the entire IOHK landscape, Professor Agalos Kiaias. If you don't know, he's the chief research scientist at IOHK. He's the one who's kind of in charge of pushing the science along. All this, all this paper writing and scientific innovation that eventually gets incorporated into prototypes and then into test nets and then into, you know, the main net. Of course, I'm skipping about a half billion steps there, but this is the guy pushing all that stuff along. So he took us through uh, kind of the state of research at uh, at IOHK. So he mentioned that uh, the paper on Hydra has been accepted into financial cryptography and data security 2021. And he pointed out the really important thing about Hydra is that it's isomorphic. So that that's to indicate that the scripting language on layer two with Hydra is identical to the one that will run on mainnet. So dApps can run on layer two with Cardano and Hydra with no changes. And he points out this is very different than a lot of other networks where the layer two is so different from the mainnet that things like dApps and scripts that work on the mainnet just won't work on layer two because it's like this completely different thing that then gets reincorporated back into mainnet. But because the scripting languages are identical in the Cardano mainnet and, uh, or I should say the base layer in the Cardano base layer and in the Hydra L2, you'll be able to run dApps on either one with no changes. He also said that Ouroboros Kronos has been accepted into Eurocrypt 2021, obviously a very pre prestigious uh, cryptography conference. And the important thing about Ouroboros Kronos, this is maybe the best like one, one sentence explanation of Kronos that I've ever heard. 
So Ouroboros Kronos is going to allow ad hoc and dynamic participation that can be used to build a global concept of time and export it to any app on the ledger. So basically, Cardano won't need to have any external reliance on an outside clock. The ledger will be its own timekeeper. This is valuable because, and I'm he didn't he didn't explain this, but this is my take on it. This is valuable because anytime you're relying on something outside of the blockchain, you have to have things like oracles, and they be, can become your weak link as far as information security goes. Right? If you if you can change the time, if you can uh, exploit the oracle that's telling you about time, then you can actually change the sequence of things. And in crypto, like in DeFi, the sequence of things can be very important. We talked a couple episodes ago about uh, some of the attacks that were happening in DeFi and uh, Ethereum where they were front-running transactions and uh, sort of sandwiching your transaction in between two transactions run by the uh, run by other people, and they were sort of exploiting your transaction so they could make money, and in turn you were end up paying more. Cardano, we don't have mining pools that are able to sequence the transactions however they want, so we don't have this front running problem that was predicted on the Ethereum network even before the network went live, but. It does, it does illustrate why the concept of time is important in blockchains. Finally, we heard about our infamous uh, elf armor or whatever mithril is. You guys keep trying to explain to me what it is. I don't know. It's some um, neckbeard stuff. But in the Cardano context, mithril is this, uh, this set of technologies that will be important for light clients. Basically, it's, it, it revolves around succinct, non-interactive arguments of knowledge that we've covered many times on this channel. It'll allow for very short, trustless proofs that can be validated very fast about things like the content of the blockchain. The whole deal with light wallets is that they don't have to sync every time you open them up. That's because they don't actually hold a copy of the blockchain. Instead, the sacrifice they make is that they're not trustless. You have to trust that the server your light wallet is interacting with actually holds an accurate version of the blockchain. With Mithril and these succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge, you can have the best of both worlds. Your light wallet can be one that doesn't sync, that doesn't have to hold a copy of the blockchain, and at the same time, it can be trustless. And Professor Kiyas reported that the paper has already been submitted on Mithril. Prototype coming soon. That pretty much wraps it up for us, except for we found out the Cardano Gogan Sun Summit will be the end of September, and you can register for that summit. Go to summit.cardano.org. Talk to you tomorrow.